Right, I think that we will go ahead and get started. And I know a few people may still be in the process of joining. So hello and welcome to the Intro to Roar webinar. It's great to see so many people here today and I'm really looking forward to walking everyone through the research organization registry. So we're holding this webinar because Roar has been around for a little over a year now, but it is still new-ish and we're still seeing a lot of interest and curiosity from people who aren't yet familiar with the project. So we wanted to provide an overview of the basics of what ROAR is and why and how it came to be. In the course of today's webinar, I'm going to do a walkthrough of the basic components of ROAR and provide some examples of how ROAR IDs can be used uh, and in fact are already being used. And then I'll close with some more information about how you can get involved in the project if you're interested in doing so and how you can stay up to date. So a couple of quick housekeeping related items. We will uh, we'll be recording, we are recording, uh, right now and we'll be sharing the recording and slides after the call. So wanted to make sure that everyone knew that. Uh, we will have ample time at the end for Q&A, uh, but in the course of the webinar, you're welcome to post uh, any questions that you have using the Q&A button in the Zoom interface. So feel free to uh, post a question as it comes up and uh, we'll either try to address them in the course of the webinar uh, and if not uh, at the very end. Uh, so uh, that is the plan for today and again thank you all for being here and welcome. I wanted to start with a quick introduction to, to me. Uh, I am Maria Gould. I am the ROAR project lead and I am based at California Digital Library which is one of the steering organizations behind ROAR. I also wanted to welcome and acknowledge that uh, also behind the scenes on the webinar today, we have some members of the ROAR outreach team who will be helping to monitor the Q&A and chat. So you might see uh, their names helping to answer questions and provide links and other information. So I also wanted to, I know this is a large number of people we have on the webinar today. We can't introduce each and every one of you, but I um, am a little curious to know a bit more about who is calling in today and what brings you here. So we're going to do a very quick poll. Hopefully you should all be seeing the results now. It's great to see people from here on this webinar from all over the world. Welcome and thanks for again for making the time to, to be here today. Uh, also, seeing broad representation from different types of organizations. And a lot of different reasons for bringing you to the webinar today, uh, especially like to see lots of interest in integrating ROAR in your system. So. Thanks for taking the poll. Thanks again for being here. Now let's dive in. So I wanted to start off today by defining a little bit what we mean when we talk about ROAR. And when we talk about ROAR, there are a few really important elements to understand just in terms of the, the basics. And the first is that ROAR is infrastructure. It is an open registry of persistent identifiers and metadata. And the registry officially launched in 2019. So we've been around for a little over a year now. And the second thing that I want to emphasize is that ROAR's focus is on identifiers and metadata for research organization affiliations. Uh, in other words, a key piece of metadata that can be used to connect research outputs um, to organizations uh, in scholarly metadata and infrastructure. So this is different um, in scope uh, than 
for example, focusing on every single department uh, within every single university or focusing on identifying all legal entities in the world. So that aspect to ROAR's scope is, is really important in terms of understanding what ROAR is trying to do. And lastly, ROAR is a community-led project and the, the focus is really on developing open data and open infrastructure for and with the scholarly research community. So that means libraries, institutions, research administrators, publishers, funders, repositories, and more. You know, basically anyone who has a stake uh, in research. And ROAR, uh, as a community effort, has its origins going back to 2016. Uh, involving collaborations between 17 uh, different organizations and, and a wider pool of stakeholders who all had an interest in developing this kind of infrastructure. Uh, so the project uh, right now is, is currently being uh, led by California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datacite, along with five other organizations as part of a, our larger steering group, um, including Digital Science, uh, which contributed the seed data from GRID that we used to launch the registry. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. We also have about 45 or so members of a broader community advisory group from all over the world. And anyone is welcome to join that group uh, and take part in this community effort. And I'll talk a little bit more about that group later on as well. So now let's talk a little bit about how ROAR came to be. And so when those 17 organizations started collaborating back in 2016, what were they trying to do and, and why? So ROAR emerged to solve a specific problem or cluster of problems. And uh, that was because in, in the world of scholarship, as, as many of you are likely <laughs> familiar, it is really important to be able to search and discover and access and cite research. It's really important to be able to find what you need and also have the assurance that your searches are providing a complete and accurate set of results. And when it comes to online scholarship, persistent identifiers are a key part of the infrastructure that we use to search and discover and access and cite research. And they're also a key part of how we tie different parts of the research landscape together. For example, if we want to be able to track all of the research products from a particular researcher. So that notion of, of how we connect the, the people and the places and the things is really central to how we, how we interact, uh, interact with and, and track and analyze research. So many of you are probably familiar with ORCID identifiers that can be used to uniquely identify researchers and to disambiguate cases in which individuals might share a name. And many of you have probably seen digital object identifiers or DOIs that are used to link to an online article or, or data set and provide persistent and long-term access to that object over time. So with ORCIDs and DOIs, you can efficiently query scholarly metadata to see all of the articles by a specific researcher, for example. But what if you wanted to see all of the articles by researchers affiliated with a specific institution? So ROAR emerged because we had already in, in the scholarly community solved this problem of how to identify the people involved in the research pro process and um, the problem of how to identify the research outputs uh, like data sets and articles um, using DOIs. But without being able to identify the institutions affiliated with those people, and with those research outputs, you can really only get so far. And so this affiliation part uh, was really the missing piece in, in the puzzle of how we, in the publishing and library and general scholarly communications world, track research outputs. And specifically, the ability to do this with an open identifier as opposed to a proprietary or commercial one was, was really the, the piece that was missing and that really motivated um, the early collaborations to develop ROAR. So to give an example of, of what happens or, or the situation with that missing piece of metadata and the problems with not having a standard way to identify affiliations, I just wanted to share an example of four different articles uh, somewhat recently published by researchers at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in various journals. And if you look uh, closely um, at the affiliations on um, these articles, 
you can see that the name of the school is actually written in four different ways. So this type of variation in, um, in you know, free text affiliations really makes it hard to get a complete picture of all of the research outputs associated with a specific institution. If there are four or even more um, you know, variations or ways to refer to the same thing. So with a standard and globally unique identifier like a ROAR ID um, used instead of those different variants of the name, we can actually use that ID to get a more complete and accurate picture of all of those outputs. So what I'm showing on the screen here is the ROAR ID uh, for the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. So the notion behind uh, building an identifier uh, for research organizations and, and developing ROAR IDs is that we can connect all of these pieces together. And when all of those pieces are connected together, uh, we really have this powerful picture um, that emerges. And, and that's really the genesis behind how ROAR came to be. So I want to, to go back to this question of why, because some of you may have already heard of other identifier schemes for organizations like GRID or ISNI or Ringgold, or maybe um, you know, you're familiar with national level identifiers or library focused identifiers. And so you might be wondering why, why ROAR? Why do we need something like ROAR too? Aren't there enough identifiers already? And so I just wanted to explain and to clarify and emphasize that the answer to that question is because ROAR is is really aiming to fill a need that hasn't been met by those other types of identifiers um, for the reasons that I presented um, at the beginning. You know, that ROAR is completely open and non-commercial, that uh, our data is CC0, our infrastructure and code are completely open and licensed uh, under an MIT license. We have an open API, which I will talk about shortly. Uh, and so that's one really key piece of it is that we are building uh, open and trusted and, and non-commercial infrastructure. Uh, and you know, the second is that uh, ROAR is focused specifically on, on this affiliation piece, on how to connect research organizations to research outputs. Uh, and the, the, you know, the third is that uh, this notion of, of a community-led project that we are developing this registry and this infrastructure uh, with by and for uh, the, the scholarly community and library community to, to make it easier to, to track outputs and to make it um, possible for libraries and institutions to um, analyze uh, you know, research outputs without having to pay to find out where their researchers are publishing, for instance. So that, that community-oriented piece is, is really important, uh, as well as the openness and interoperability um, of ROAR's data and ROAR's infrastructure, you know, with the notion that uh, the IDs are interoperable with, with others, which I'll explain shortly, um, that the IDs can be implemented in any system, which I know many of you are interested in doing, <laughs> uh, and that the um, ROAR metadata can be deposited in and searched in scholarly indexes like Crossref and Datacite. So, so the answer to why we need something like ROAR is that the other types of solutions um, that had kind of come before ROAR and that still exists today don't quite check all of those boxes and meet all of those needs, either because uh, they are not open or their scope is different uh, or because they're not being developed as community projects. So that in a nutshell is uh, why, why ROAR exists and, and how it came to be. So uh, having gone through that preamble of, uh, of what uh, and why I wanted now to take you all on a tour of the registry and its core components so you can see what is in ROAR right now and what you can do with it. So there are a few different ways to see what is in the registry right now. One way is through a simple search on the ROAR website at roar.org search. There are almost 98,000 organizations in the registry right now, each with a unique ROAR ID. In this example, I am showing the results of a search for my organization, which is California Digital Library. And uh, again, an important thing to keep in mind about the scope of ROAR 
um, is, you know, as you'll recall, we're focused on capturing affiliations for research organizations. And so that means that ROAR is a top level registry of organizations. We are not mapping individual hierarchies within universities, for instance, um, because the specific problem we are trying to solve is how to connect organizations to outputs. Another way that anyone can search and filter organizations in the registry is through ROAR's open API. And lastly, all of the ROAR data can be downloaded as a JSON file if you prefer to work with it in that format. So the JSON files are all downloadable from Figshare. I'm just showing an example here of what that looks like. So now let's take a walkthrough of an example record in the ROAR registry, going back to this one from California Digital Library. The first thing that I want to point out is the ROAR ID itself. Uh, this is a URL that will always resolve to the organization's re uh, record. So that's why I'm highlighting it in two places here. Uh, in the screenshot, you can see the ROAR ID uh, in the, the front end interface for the ROAR record and in the address bar from the browser, you can also see um, the URL resolving to that record. The ROAR ID is an opaque string, uh, which as in the interest of supporting long-term persistence. And the string starts with a leading zero and it's followed by six characters and a checksum. In addition to the ROAR ID, we have metadata about each organization in the registry. So this currently includes the organization name, names in other languages, including multiple character sets, uh, acronyms, and the organization website and location. As I mentioned earlier, ROAR was launched with seed data from uh, the Digital Science Grid database, and that was um, part of Digital Science's involvement in the startup phase of the project to help launch the registry, um, and Digital Science remains part of the ROAR steering group. And so this meant that uh, by starting with the grid data, we didn't have to build ROAR from scratch. And what we're working on now is setting up ROAR's technical infrastructure um, to be able to uh, curate and manage uh, its data independently. The ROAR records also include other identifiers for the organization when these exist. This interoperability is really important for ROAR to be widely adopted and used and also to support crosswalks between different types of identifiers. So ROAR currently maps to GRID, to ISNI, to Wikidata, Crossref Funder Registry, and a few others. In this example, uh, you do not see the Crossref Funder Registry on the front end interface because uh, CDL in this instance is not a funder. We also built uh, some tools to facilitate working with ROAR data in the registry and using ROAR IDs to clean up affiliation data. For example, uh, we have a reconciler available that works with OpenRefine, and you can use this reconciler if you have messy um, data sets with inconsistent affiliation text strings, you can use the reconciler to clean up those affiliation lists and map them all to ROAR IDs, so you can end up with clean and disambiguated institutional data. And we also have affiliation matching functionality built into the ROAR API that allows you to feed the API a free text affiliation string and then have it match to the corresponding ROAR ID. This is something that a number of users have asked about because they may um, be interested in working with ROAR but have a large amount of legacy content that has affiliation strings already present in them and um, those users want to retroactively um, map those affiliations to uh, ROAR IDs instead. So we have this matching functionality available to do that. So now that we've done a walkthrough of the registry itself, I want to turn to how ROAR can work in practice. And that's because the registry isn't really useful on its own, or is it meant to be useful on its own. The aim is really for ROAR IDs to be implemented in various systems and captured in research metadata so that we can connect those pieces of the puzzle and generate uh, powerful and, and meaningful insights about, about research. So 
let's take a quick tour of one uh, example of a current ROAR implementation. So one way to understand ROAR in action uh, is through this um, current workflow that's happening with dataset publishing with the Dryad platform that relaunched in late 2019. And when Dryad relaunched its platform, they built an integration with ROAR for researcher affiliations. And that means, as the animation is showing here, uh, that uh, when a researcher submits a data set to Dryad and provides an affiliation, the system uh, calls the ROAR API to find a match in ROAR, and then the researcher chooses their affiliation from the list of options. So what the researcher sees is, is somewhat invisible in terms of how ROAR is working in the background. But what it means for Dryad is that Dryad is able to collect uh, clean and consistent affiliation data for each data set that is submitted. So after the data, uh, after the researcher uh, enters their affiliation and that calls the ROAR API, Dryad will then be able to store the ROAR ID in its database. And then Dryad deposits its metadata in Datasite. And when they do that, the ROAR IDs that they've collected are sent to Datasite as well. So you can see in this example here how the ROAR ID shows up in the Datasite XML metadata. And then completing this pipeline, the research in Datasite can be searched on spe specific affiliations, uh, which are based on ROAR IDs provided by Datasite members like Dryad. So this is the public search interface that anyone can use to look up research uh, in Datasite. So this example from Dryad and from Datasite really show the power, the, the power of an affiliation ID like ROAR, uh, where we have Datasite metadata supporting ROAR IDs uh, and then we have a system uh, like Dryad collecting the ROAR IDs and then sending that metadata to Datasite. So uh, having that kind of end-to-end -end, uh, process and pipeline um, is really the best illustration of, of how useful it can be to collect uh, ROAR IDs and then make, uh, that, make that affiliation data searchable in scholarly metadata. So we also see uh, a similar kind of pipeline in the works uh, and you know, see, see the promise of that happening uh, with publishing workflows as well with, um, with journals and with journal articles, um, especially because Crossref right now is in the process of updating its metadata schema um, to include support for ROAR IDs. And so uh, we're envisioning and would love to, to talk to you know, further uh, with publishers and with system providers about how to do this, but really seeing a similar kind of pipeline in the works with, uh, with journal publishing so that researchers submitting an article um, can uh, provide an affiliation and the manuscript tracking system can collect the ROAR ID for the author's affiliation instead of a free text string. Uh, the ROAR ID could also be useful as part of journal checks for competing interests, uh, for example, to rule out any reviewers or editors who might have the same affiliation as the author. And then if the paper is accepted, the, the ROAR ID and ROAR affiliation can be displayed with the author information uh, when the article is published online. And the publisher can deposit uh, its metadata uh, in an index like Crossref and include the ROAR ID in the metadata. So anyone can search Crossref metadata to find scholarly articles associated um, with a specific affiliation. Uh, and the idea is that the ROAR ID will also be available in the Crossref API so that um, service providers and other tools can access uh, and read that information. So downstream, there are even more ways in which we see ROAR IDs being useful in publishing related workflows. And so those uh, include uh, helping publishers who might be needing to identify authors with institutions um, to ensure accurate billing. ROAR IDs could be helpful in terms of determining eligibility for APC waivers based on institutional affiliation um, or as part of uh, funder compliance checks reporting to institutions and a special publishing arrangements as part of transformative agreements with libraries. So the ability uh, to 
you know, we're also seeing, you know, with, with libraries how, um, you know, raw IDs can be a valuable piece of data to help inform library licensing negotiations with publishers, for instance, and to understand how many authors that might be publishing in a specific journal or with a specific publisher, um, and to use that information to help make collection spending decisions. Uh, we're also seeing, you know, how having metadata uh, searchable in, in Crossref, places like Crossref can provide institutions with really powerful data and insights to help with research administration, um, with reporting and outreach on campuses about uh, what and where researchers are publishing. So in addition to Dryad and Datasite and the forthcoming Crossref integration, there are a number of other implementations that have been completed or are in progress since ROAR's launch last year. And this list shows the integrations that we know about at this point. There may be more. Uh, if you have one and it's not on this list, please let us know. Uh, but you can see just from the examples listed here that there are a range of, of different applications and different um, contexts in which ROAR IDs can be helpful. And broad adoption is really going to be key to ROAR's growth and success in the coming years uh, to make, uh, you know, to really make these connections more visible and make this, all of this metadata more useful. So ROAR has launched and the registry data is stable and available and ROAR IDs are being integrated in different systems. So what comes next for ROAR? I'm going to talk a little bit about things to expect in, in the year and years to come and things that the ROAR team is working on. So we're really focused uh, on and expecting, you know, three main things this year and in the years ahead. And the first, as I, as I just mentioned, is is adoption, is how, uh, how can we get ROAR IDs integrated in as many systems as possible in any scholarly system really that collects affiliations uh, and how we can support connections to data site and Crossref so the metadata can be um, queried and searched uh, and, and used. And downstream, how we can support libraries and research administrators and other stakeholders in using that data uh, so um, this is all part of the adoption strategy that we're working on and we would, you know, love to talk with you if you're interested in integrating ROAR in your system or if you have ideas about um, how you might use ROAR data, we would uh, love to learn more about that and uh, generate some other ideas and use cases um, to inform um, the, the next phase of the product development. Uh, and a second, a second thing that we're focused on is curation. So we launched the registry with uh, seed data from GRID and we were very fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, and the next uh, phase of work and the next step that we need to take um, is setting up ROAR independently. Um, so we're working right now on developing um, the technical infrastructure and also appropriate curation workflows for long-term stewardship of the registry data in keeping with the ROAR goals and scope um, and also um, with regular uh, community feedback and input. So uh, the last uh, key theme and key area of focus for, for this year and the years ahead um, is that ROAR is a, um, you know, we're looking at sustainability and how we can um, ensure the, the long-term uh, growth and stability of the registry over time. So ROAR is a collaborative cross-organization effort that functions primarily on in-kind resources and we're trying to keep the overhead low and keep um, the effort as community-based as possible. So we don't plan or see a need to establish a new legal organization for ROAR. Um, that being said, there are basic costs associated with sustaining the registry over time, including um, personnel resources, uh, as well as, you know, uh, development and outreach and um, technical logistics like server hosting. So uh, open infrastructure um, isn't free to build or maintain. So we're doing some fundraising right now to secure startup funds through community investments and grants. Uh, and then we plan to introduce an optional paid service tier starting in 2022 that will um, really be designed to allow ROAR to cover its basic costs while also ensuring that we can keep the core registry data open and free in perpetuity 
for everyone. So to bring this, this portion of the webinar to close, I really just want to reiterate that ROAR is a community-driven effort and that there are many ways to get involved in the project if you're interested in doing so and uh, different ways as well to stay up to date on future news uh, and events. So one of the best ways to be involved in ROAR, in my opinion, is to join the community advisory group. This group meets uh, for bi-monthly calls to discuss project updates and hear feedback. Uh, and that has also led to some smaller working groups operating in parallel as well. For the past two years, we've also held an in-person community meeting co-located with Pitapalooza. Um, showing uh, a scene here when we all roared together. And obviously our events and outreach are focused on virtual interactions um, these days, but it's, it's really great to be able to connect with uh, people from all over the world who are interested in giving feedback on the project and interested in doing different things with Roar. So all are welcome. Um, you're not required to make every call. We always um, record and send around notes afterwards to keep everybody informed. So. Uh, there will be links um, sent around when we circulate the slides afterwards, but if you're interested in joining the group, you can email info at roar.org. And just to give you a quick sense of the wide range of community members that have been part of the group so far, we have many different types of organizations represented, kind of mirroring the results of the poll that we saw. Um, and this really speaks to the broad benefits and, uh, and promise that ROAR holds for many types of stakeholders. And besides the option to join the community group, if you're interested, there are additional ways to stay on top of project news and updates. So um, that includes following posts on the ROAR blog. Uh, we also have an open Slack workspace that anyone is welcome to join for discussions. You can follow and contribute issues on GitHub. You can follow our Twitter feed and the Twitter handle is uh, right there on the slide. Uh, and we also have a mailing list that you can sign up uh, for, which is um, the link should be in the footer of the ROAR website. So you can sign up to receive updates in that form as well. And uh, again, we are recording this webinar right now and we will be sending around the recording uh, and the slides after the call. So you don't need to write down uh, these, these links if, if you don't want to, because we will send them to you. So that concludes uh, my tour and walkthrough and overview of the research organization registry. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to, to be part of this journey today and to um, really appreciate your, your interest and enthusiasm for the project. Uh, and I just wanted to reiterate that uh, if you do want to get in touch or talk about anything further, the ROAR um, email address is listed here on this slide. So I think we have a little bit of time for some Q&A. So let me take a quick look at what we have going on there. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to type in your questions as well. So seeing one question here in the chat window, and then I'll jump over to the Q&A panel about the API and how it can support integrations with other platforms. Uh, so the, the ROAR API is open and, and available for uh, all types of integrations. The, um, you can check out the, the API documentation on the ROAR GitHub site. The link will be in these slides. Um, one, you know, one really straightforward way in which the API is being used is the example from Dryad that I shared. Uh, that was a pretty simple way to build an affiliation lookup into the Dryad interface to collect researcher affiliations. It did not represent a lot of developer time, so it was a pretty lightweight <laughs> kind of integration in terms of uh, development resources that are required. I think uh, to, you know, to get to the broader spirit of, of your question about 
how it can support integrations with other platforms, I, I think the answer is really yes, it can support <laughs> integrations with other platforms, but uh, you know, we would like to know, you know, we would encourage anybody who's interested in, in using the API and in integrating it to check out the documentation and to, you know, get in touch if you have questions or, or need support. But um, it's really, you know, the idea being that we have the API available for anybody to use who's interested in doing so. So appreciate that question. So let me take a look at the ones that are in the Q&A panel here. Um, one question about how big is the database? Number of records is just shy of 98,000 organizations. I do not know the answer to the question of how many bytes, <laughs> but I do know that we have close to, we have about 97,975 organizations in the registry at the moment. So that corresponds to 97,795 records. I would have to look further into this question of, of bytes. Uh, let's see. Um, this is a really uh, interesting question from LJ Garcia about timeframes for affiliations and uh, this notion of, you know, people move and change affiliations and can that be captured? And yes, that is, that is totally true. Uh, so, you know, this is something that we're really looking, you know, I think that to some extent will be somewhat dictated by uh, the information that, uh, that the a publisher, for example, wants to, wants to collect. It might be, you know, the publisher's policy to reflect the affiliation um, that was true at the, you know, at the time that the research was conducted or at the time that the paper was published, um, if those two are different. Uh, we are also um, you know, aware that ORCID is, is presently working on building support for ROAR IDs um, into their system. And so ORCID has done a lot of work uh, in terms of you know, assertion tracking and how um, you know, research, uh, researchers' you know, roles and, and positions can change over time. And so uh, there's, you know, there may be some options within ORCID to kind of reflect how those affiliations change over time as well. So let's see. I'm trying to get to some new ones here. Um, So seeing some questions about um, curation and about grid uh, and hierarchies with, within ROAR. And so let me just address a couple of these in a cluster. Um, so uh, one thing that I wanted to mention uh, related to um, relationships and hierarchies is that uh, GRID does currently include some basic relationships like uh, parent-child and uh, related institutes in GRID. When we launched the MVR, or we won't launch the first prototype uh, of the registry in early 2019, um, using the seed data from GRID, we did not uh, include that relationship metadata when we launched, just in the interest of being able to get the registry up and running as soon as possible. Uh, so we are working right now on bringing that uh, basic relationship metadata into ROAR to be able to reflect that in ROAR um, as well. Uh, so uh, I'm seeing some questions around, you know, how we square uh, this, you know, notion of basic relationships with uh, ROAR's focus on being, you know, top level uh, registry of affiliations. And uh, there, you know, there is a need to reflect some basic hierarchies um, at that kind of top level affiliation. So like a, a main university system like University of California and then individual uh, campuses um, like UCLA. So, uh, so there is some sense of a, a basic parent-child kind of hierarchy in ROAR without going into the 
um, you know, details of mapping, you know, individual departments within a university, for example, because um, that is, you know, really out of scope for this um, focus on um, capturing the, the top level affiliations that would be associated with a research output. So another, see some, see, also seeing some questions about integrations. Uh, so they, uh, let me just scroll through a few of these. So seeing some questions around integrations of different publisher systems. Uh, and whether, uh, whether there are plans in place to do that. Uh, we, are, we are having some conversations with some system providers and service providers at the moment. And I know there's a lot of interest on the publisher side and uh, integrating in, in, among some publishers and integrating raw IDs. So those, um, those conversations are, are underway. Um, we, uh, there is uh, uh, nothing that has gone live or is planned to go live at this point, uh, but uh, that kind of work takes a lot of time as, as, as we know. So um, if people are interested in, in talking more about that, uh, I'd be happy to set up a call. Uh, I'm kind of related to that. Do most scientific journals require ROAR IDs for publication? So uh, ROAR is not yet integrated into uh, any journals as, as, as far as I am aware. Um, oh, I there, believe there is one um, that will be launching at some point called Physiome um, that is going to be requiring ROAR IDs, kind of similar to how Dryad is requiring it. Um, but again, you know, I, I want to emphasize as well that, you know, the, the ROAR ID is kind of happening in the background when an author provides an affiliation. So it's not really author facing um, in the way that an ORCID ID might be. Uh, so we hope that um, journals will require or, you know, will, will integrate ROAR into their systems. And so those conversations are ongoing. Let's see. Another question about the API and about high volume API requests and whether those are supported, for example, for a one time batch mapping and disambiguation of the data set to ROAR IDs. Um, yes, that should be supported. Uh, give it a try. If you run into any issues, just let us know. And, you know, similar to the um, you know, we have the API as well as these other tools like the Open Refine Reconciler that can help with that kind of mapping and cleanup as well. Let's see. How often are we getting the uh, data from Grid? And so, yeah, let me go back to a couple of other questions about curation and, and Grid. So we're still working closely with Grid at the moment uh, to um, make updates and, and changes and, and additions uh, in the registry. Uh, so that's currently happening uh, every few months or so. There's a new, uh, a new update. Uh, and then when the Grid update comes out, we sync those changes uh, in ROAR. So currently, the registry is, um, you know, being updated every few months or so, kind of on the same timeline that Grid is uh, making updates. Uh, and then going forward as we're building out our um, independent curation and management workflows with, with ROAR, we will, you know, establish uh, whatever kind of frequency and, and schedule makes the most sense for ROAR. Let's see. I'm not sure how to indicate which ones of these I've answered. I'm just trying to cluster them in the interest of time and try to pick up on some on some themes. 
Uh, so I think we have time for a few more. If you have follow-up questions after this webinar, please feel free to get in touch if you want to talk about anything in, in more detail. Uh, I'm seeing a question here. Um, is Roar going to open up the platform so anybody can add their records uh, if it is valid, like what there is in Wikipedia? So, so that's a really interesting question. The, the focus that we have right now in, in terms of curation is uh, you know, Roar is already quite comprehensive at approximately 98,000 organizations. We, you know, we do know that uh, there is, you know, there are affiliations that may not already be included in Roar. And so um, we have a curation um, request form that is available on the Roar website that anybody can use to make a suggestion, either to add a new organization to Roar or to make changes to an existing record. Uh, we also know that you know, some of you may be managing national level uh, databases of organizations or, you know, at the regional level or, or what have you and might be interested in, in sharing that. Um, data with Roar, and we would really, you know, welcome discussions uh, ab about that. Um, it's it's not quite scalable for Roar itself um, to uh, to include, uh, you know, data from every single uh, national registry or regional registry that might exist in the world. But you know, we hope that you know Roar IDs um, could kind of work work in reverse and be integrated into those local level registries. Uh, we are working out processes with community members right now, building community-based um, curation and curation review processes to evaluate, um, you know, questions around um, how we, you know, how we receive changes to the registry, how we might handle changes to organizations over time and what needs to be reflected um, you know in the in the roar metadata to support that in terms of versioning and provenance uh, so there's a lot of work um, that's happening right now with community members to think through how how we do that uh, we're not seeing you know and so the model that we're working with right now is really um, you know this notion of of community-based and centralized curation of the registry, we're not, you know, necessarily seeing uh, seeing a great need uh, or or reason to have individual organizations responsible for managing their own metadata, but to be able to have really, you know, open um, and transparent processes for communicating changes um, to us, and to have a kind of trusted and community based, uh, you know, group of of people who are working on curating and stewarding the Roar data. Uh, so. Um, this is really, you know, kind of an evolving process. And so if you're interested in learning more about that or in sharing your, um, your input or expertise in that area, I would encourage you to, to get in touch and we can talk further. So I hope that answered that question about where we're at with the curation uh, right now. Let's see, let's take a couple more questions. So kind of filling, uh, following up on what I was just talking about and also going back to what we, uh, what I was saying about ORCID and how researchers' affiliations might change over time, um, there's a question about um, whether variations uh, in a name or changes in the structure of an, of an organization over time will also be reflected in a Aurora record. So yes, that's something that we would like to be able to support uh, and the, um, that is, you know, something that we're looking at right now in terms of how to how to reflect that uh, in in the raw record and how we might support versioning. Um, we are having a public data dump each time we make a new update to Roar, and so at least we are preserving for now um, the historical um, record of you know snapshot of what the registry was at a certain point um, in time. So interesting question about the percent of research institutions in Europe already registered with a Roar ID. Off the top of my head, I, I do not know, uh, but uh, you, uh, there could be a way to get some of that information um, out of the Roar API and cross-reference that to whatever list of European research organizations you have. So let's see, time for one or two more. 
that I haven't gotten to yet. Thanks to everyone for all of these questions. These are really, these are really great questions. I think what I'll close with is, do we co cooperate with other scholarly infrastructures for the curation of the organizational data? Um, again, that's something that uh, we are working on right now with members of the community advisory group and in, in looking at how we curate the RORE data. Um, and you know, we're really trying to build out some both infrastructure and policies that, uh, that are community-based and that also you know, we'll make sure that ROAR is, um, can be widely adopted uh, in scholarly infrastructure more widely. So that spirit of cooperation is, uh, is really central. So I think we'll bring this to a close. I really appreciate everybody taking the time to call in today to ask questions. I hope that I was able to provide a sufficient overview of, of the registry and the project and what is um, happening right now and happening in the future. I would encourage you to stay in touch and to uh, follow up with any questions that you might have after this or if you want to talk more specifics about integrations and other ideas that you have. Uh, this is, you know, truly a community project and really depends on active engagement uh, you know, by the community. It's, it's not just me. It's not just the project team. It, it really is a broad effort. So, uh, so I really encourage you to stay involved if you're interested. Uh, and I look forward to hearing more from you and working with some of you in the future. And thank you again uh, for, for being here, for asking questions. Thank you to the outreach uh, colleagues as well for um, answering folks' questions and uh, walking through uh, the logistics of the webinar interface as well. So I really appreciate everyone's help. <laughs>